Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's four o'clock. Uh, we should get a start on. Welcome to the APSC JCS 2020 webinar. The session is APSC MicroClip Consensus Statement Session, organized by APSC JCS, endorsed by the Singapore Cardiac Society, ISCP, and supported by Abbott. A date stamp to this event is the 31st of July, 4 p.m. Uh, Singapore time. With me, we have a whole host of very esteemed speakers as well as panelists, and we tend to make this session very interactive uh, for this complex uh, topic. Um, my name is Jack. Um, I'm a cardiologist uh, from Singapore and the president of the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology. The content of this webinar is copyrighted uh, by APSC and should not be distributed without the prior permission of APSC. The views and opinion expressed in the webinar are those of the faculty members and do not necessarily re represent those of APSC. Uh, housekeeping. This uh, content is currently live streamed by Rutherford Medicine, APSC Facebook and YouTube uh, page. For Singapore registered physicians, CME points are awarded to attendees who are active for at least an hour. This session is CME accredited by EBAC for one CME point for attendees who attend the full session. You will receive your certificate of attendance upon completing an online survey, sent by email after the webinar. Again, we intend to answer all the questions that you raise and please feel free to key in the Q&A section we will endeavor to answer your question one way or another. Um, this other exciting announcement is that tomorrow, we're gonna to have our APSC virtual convocation ceremony on the 1st uh, August at uh, 2 p.m. Japan time. So join us, it's gonna be a fun session tomorrow. And I know today actually is a Hari Raya Haji and a lot of our Muslim uh, uh, fellow cardiologists and staff are celebrating their public holiday. So I wish them a salamat, happy Hari Raya, Haji. My co-chairperson is uh, Professor KK Yo, and uh, he's my Heart Center MitroClip program lead, as well as PI of the Mass Registry in Asia. So it's uh, no better person to lead this uh, uh, session than uh, KK, my good uh, colleague and friend. So KK is uh, going to introduce the rest of the speakers. Thanks, uh, Jack, and uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here today with all of you at, uh, at the uh, APSC JCS 2020 uh, uh, MitroClip Consensus Statement Webinar. Uh, other than uh, Jack, uh, who's one of our co-chairs, uh, the other co-chair is uh, Kentaro Hayashida um, from Keio University, uh, uh, Japan. Uh, he's uh, uh, one of uh, Japan's leading uh, structural interventionalists, and we are delighted that he can join us as one of our co-chairs. Allow me to introduce our other uh, speakers and panelists. Uh, Professor Greg Stone uh, needs no introduction. He's from uh, Mount Sinai a Hospital in the United States and has, uh, among many of his uh, multiple uh, research studies, uh, has the, been the lead for the COEPS study. And he'll be giving us a talk on uh, the Mitral France and the COEPS studies. Our uh, other speaker is uh, Dr. Takashi Matsumoto, uh, who's the uh, from uh, Sendai Kosei Hospital in Japan. Um, um, he's the leading uh, mitroclip implanter in Japan and uh, he will give us uh, a talk on the mitroclip experience in Japan. Our other um, panelists today include uh, Professor Greg Scalia from Australia. He's an echocardiologist. Professor Alex Lee from uh, Hong Kong, also an echocardiologist. Uh, Professor John Chan uh, from uh, Malaysia, uh, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, he's a cardiothoracic surgeon. Uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Yu Si Hui, uh, Director of Ecolab in the Heart Center in Singapore. Uh, next slide, please. We also have uh, Dr. Adam Song from uh, Taipei in Taiwan. Uh, he's uh, one of uh, Taiwan's uh, leading uh, mitroclip implanters and a heart failure specialist as well. Uh, Professor David Sim, a good friend and a colleague at the National Heart Center Singapore. He's the Director of our Heart Failure Program. We have had many interesting discussions on the microclip uh, in, in Singapore. And uh, lastly, but not least, uh, Dr. Krisada Mimuk, a uh, uh, cardiologist from Thailand, 
Um, he's since he went back to Thailand, his numbers uh, with the Mitro Clip has uh, skyrocketed, and uh, I think he's uh, catching up with my numbers too. So um, with that introduction, uh, allow me to now jump into our first talk. Uh, the first talk is by uh, Professor Greg Stone. He'll be giving us a talk on the Mitro Clip, uh, sorry, Mitro FR and the Coab trials uh, and overview. Uh, this is a recorded talk, so you will hear him uh, and see him on, on screen. Thank you. Hello, this is Greg W. Stone from Mount Sinai Heart Health System, and it's my pleasure today to give you this lecture on using the mitral clip to reduce mitral regurgitation and heart failure, and specifically, I'll be comparing and contrasting the mitral FR in the COAP trials. These are my relative disclosures. So when we talk about secondary mitral regurgitation and heart failure, we have to realize this is a situation where the problem is the left ventricle, and that is either because of ischemic cardiomyopathy or idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, there's apical and lateral translocation of the papillary muscles, and that of course connects to the chordae tendinae, which attach to the anterior and posterior mitral leaflet, and that geometric um, distortion of the papillary muscles pulls on or tethers the mitral valve leaflets and keeps them from coapting. And as a result, you get mitral regurgitation of what is otherwise a relatively normal mitral valve. So in secondary mitral regurgitation, the left ventricle is what is sick and it makes an otherwise normal mitral valve dysfunctional. Now in about 10% of the cases, primary uh, atrial mechanism of functional mitral regurgitation can be present, which, which is due to mitral annular dilatation due usually to left atrial enlargement due to atrial fibrillation. But the by, far, by far the majority is due to left ventricular dysfunction causing secondary mitral regurgitation. And we've known for a long time from multiple studies that the greater the amount of secondary mitral regurgitation, the worse the prognosis. And in large-scale studies, secondary mitral regurgitation has been an independent predictor of both heart failure hospitalizations as well as mortality. The question has always been if we then correct the secondary mitral regurgitation without affecting the underlying left ventricular dysfunction, will that improve the prognosis? So we start, we talk about the vicious cycle of secondary MR. We start with global or regional left ventricular dysfunction. This causes LV dilatation. That causes mitral leaflet tethering in MR. That causes LV volume overload and LV dilatation. That causes more leaflet tethering and more MR, and you get this vicious cycle. And again, the question is, if we interrupt just the MR aspect, will that um, uh, importantly affect reduce enough of the LV volume overload to improve the prognosis for the patient. Well, we look usually to our surgical colleagues to see if they can make a difference for the prognosis of our patients. And unlike degenerative mitral regurgitation, where surgery is curative because the problem is a sick mitral valve, in primary left ventricular dysfunction with secondary MR, while we don't have any randomized trials, nor do we have even large observational studies to suggest that fixing the secondary MR, which is usually done with an undersized annuloplasty ring, improves prognosis. This, the largest study, an older study, but still the largest, usually quoted from the University of Michigan, shows that among patients who underwent surgery for isolated secondary mitral regurgitation, their prognosis was unchanged from those undergoing just medical treatment. So until recently, medical therapy for the underlying left ventricular dysfunction had been the gold standard of care, possibly cardiac resynchronization therapy in those patients that had the appropriate sort of conduction abnormalities. So in comes the MitroClip system, which is a transcatheter system, uh, which um, a device is inserted in the femoral vein, it then crosses from the right atrium into, across the atrial septum, uh, into the left atrium, and then across the mitral valve, and one or more clips are used to attach the anterior and posterior mitral leaflets, creating a so-called uh, double orifice, um, or bow tie repair. And this was based on a surgical stitch technique developed uh, in Milan by Ottavio Affieri. 
It's a very simple, uh, very safe procedure. Uh, it usually does not eliminate mitral regurgitation, but it can markedly decrease MR. And this was first studied um, about a decade ago in the Everest II randomized trial in which 279 low-risk patients uh, were randomized to either the mitral clip or to surgery. And again, this was a mix of about three-quarters degenerative iron, one-quarter functional mitral regurgitation. It turns out in this trial, the mitral clip was not as good as surgery. It certainly was much safer than surgery. You can see a marked reduction in major adverse events, but its clinical effectiveness could not match surgery in terms of the reduction in mitral regurgitation and the need for a second procedure. However, when we looked at all of the subgroups that were studied in this relatively small um, uh, 279 patient randomized trial, the one subgroup that stuck out, stood out was whether or not the patient had functional or degenerative mitral regurgitation. The patient with degenerative MR clearly did better with surgery, whereas the patient with functional or secondary MR seemed to do similar with surgery and the mitral clip. Maybe the point estimate even favored the mitral clip a little bit. Uh, but again, we don't know that surgery benefits this patient, so this may just mean that neither therapy benefits the patient. So there were two randomized trials that have now been completed uh, looking at patients with heart failure who are symptomatic on medications, uh, who have um, severe mitral regurgitation, and then are randomized to either continue medical therapy alone, which is the standard of care for heart failure patients with secondary MR, versus medical therapy plus the mitral clip. And the first was the MITRA FR trial. And in this trial, there was absolutely no difference in the primary endpoint of death or heart failure hospitalization out to one year, uh, with no difference in death or heart failure hospitalization separately, and with outcomes out to two years, there also was no difference. So this was very disappointing. At the same time, a somewhat more ambitious, about twice the size of that trial was being performed called the COAP trial. And this was a parallel controlled, open label, multi-center trial in 614 patients with heart failure and three plus or four plus secondary MR who remained symptomatic despite maximally tolerated doses of guideline directed medical therapy. And here the patients were again randomized to the mitral clip with the um, plus guideline directed medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. And the primary endpoint of the COAP trial was all hospitalizations for heart failure within 24 months. And in contrast to MITRA FR, there was a marked reduction in heart failure hospitalizations. You could see this is about a 50% reduction. The curves spread almost immediately after randomization. The number needed to treat to save one heart failure hospitalization in 24 months was only three patients. It was an extremely safe procedure with very high success rates and only 3.4% uh, adverse events. And most importantly, when you looked at all-cause mortality, there was a very robust, um, absolute 17% reduction in mortality of two years, relative 38% reduction in mortality. The number needed to treat to save one life was only six patients. And you can see that unlike the heart failure curves, here the curves didn't start separating until about nine to 12 months, consistent with the long-term benefits of reduction in volume overload after mitral clip treatment. In fact, if you looked at the patients in COAP that had an injection fraction of less than or equal to 40%, those that are classically defined as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, the number needed to treat to save one life was only five patients, compared to anywhere from 20 to 50 for most of our guideline, uh, class one guideline heart failure medications and CRT. So extremely effective therapy. So we have two different randomized trials here, MITRAF R on the left and COAPT on the right. And these are the death and heart failure hospitalization rates at two years. And you can see absolutely no benefit in MITRAF R and a marked benefit in COAPT. Now, the left ventricular ejection fraction was about 31% in COAPT and about 33% in MITRAF R, so very similar. And both in recruited heart failure patients compared with mitral clip compared to ongoing medical therapy. So what were the differences that explain these disparate or discordant results? Well, we think there are three main reasons. And the first is that um, the two different trials enrolled quite different patient populations. 
Vitref R enrolled patients with severe MR by the European guidelines, which required either an EROA of greater than 20 millimeters squared or a regurgitant volume of greater than 30 millimeters per beat, milliliters per beat. In contrast, the COAP trial required an EROA of greater than 30 millimeters squared or a regurgitant volume of greater than 40 mLs per beat or pulmonary systolic venous flow reversal and used an integrated approach um, to determine what was severe MR. So as a result, the um, mitral regurgitation was substantially more severe in COAP. The effective regurgitant orifice area was 41 millimeters squared in COAP compared to 31 millimeters squared in mitral FR. In addition, COAP put a cap on how big the left ventricle could be. Left ventricular end systolic dimension less than seven centimeters because we didn't want to enroll patients with end stage left ventricular dilatation where the patients might not be able to respond. And such a restriction was not um, implemented in mitral FR. As a result, the left ventricular end diastolic volume, normal is about 70 to 75 mLs per meter squared, was um, moderately increased in COAF, but markedly increased in mitra FR. So Paul Graeber and Mill Packer, um, uh, to help explain this, introduced this concept of um, proportionate versus disproportionate MR. And the severity of MR can be estimated by the regurgitant orifice area, but that will depend on multiple different parameters, including the left ventricular systolic pressure, the left atrial pressure, and importantly, the left ventricular end diastolic volume. So for very large left ventricular end diastolic volumes, you may need an EROA of 0.4 centimeters squared, or 4, 40 millimeters squared, to signify severe MR whereas for a small left ventricle, only 20 millimeters squared will signify severe MR. So if you look here at this relationship between left ventricular end diastolic volume and EROA, the mean populations in mitral FR and COAP were quite different. COAP had a higher EROA and a smaller left ventricular end diastolic volume, mitral FR the opposite. Now, this disproportionately severe MR category is really very severe MR. Proportionally severe MR in this gray zone is really severe MR, and non-severe MR is non-severe MR. And basically, the concept is, is that very severe MR will benefit greatly from MR reduction. Severe MR will benefit from MR reduction somewhat, and non-severe MR likely will not. Now, of course, these were population means in COAPT and MITRE FR, and of course, there was a range of patients uh, in COAPT, but they were mostly likely very severe MR, where in mitral FR, they were mostly severe MR mixed with non-severe MR. So the bottom line is here are three different patients with an ERA of 30 millimeters squared. And you can see the patient on the right has a relatively small ventricle. So that EROA is very large in relation to the ventricular size. That patient is likely to benefit from MR correction. In contrast, the patient on the left has a markedly enlarged left ventricle, and that patient is not likely to benefit. So it just turns out that mitra FR probably enrolled more of these patients, where COAPT enrolled more of these patients. The second reason is that COAPT required that all patients be on maximally tolerated guideline-directed medical therapy and still remain symptomatic. And we used an eligibility committee to ensure this. In mitra FR, on the other hand, they could be on lower doses of heart failure meds, and the heart failure meds could fluctuate during treatment. Possibly, uh, we don't know this for sure because the medications weren't assessed during follow-up, but they may have treated the control population more intensely during follow-up than the mitroclip population. In contrast, there were few major changes in medications in COAP. So background therapies do matter. And third, if one looks just at the success rates, the success rates were somewhat higher in COAP, the complication rate was lower in COAP, and most importantly, there were more clips placed in the patients in COAP, and the durability was substantially greater. And this is likely because the North American sites participating in the COAP trial had been using the MitraClip for 10 years in multiple different study experiences where the operators in Mitra FR were relatively newer to the device. And finally, if you look at COAPT, among every single patient population that we studied, there was relatively comparable benefit. So if you use the COAPT enrollment criteria 
uh, we would expect those patients to benefit from MR reduction. So on March 14th of 2019, the FDA approved the MitraClip for treatment of select patients with secondary MR who remain symptomatic despite guideline-directed medical therapy. And while I won't read this entire label, they basically said follow the COAP criteria of an ejection fraction of 20 to 50 percent, left ventricular and systolic diameter of less than seven centimeters, maximally tolerated guideline-directed medical therapy, still symptomatic. And now we've seen this incorporated into the guidelines as well as an alternative to medical therapy as a life-saving measure in which patients will markedly benefit if they have COAP criteria. So in conclusion, COAP and MITRE-FR provide complementary guidance for patient selection, demonstrating which patients with heart failure and secondary MR are likely and unlikely to benefit from MR reduction. The FDA is approved and the guidelines support the MitraClip for patients with heart failure and secondary MR meeting COAP criteria. Strict reliance to these criteria should allow duplication of the COAP results in the real world while avoiding overtreatment. And finally, the profound beneficial impact of the MitraClip in patients with heart failure meeting COAP criteria has important implications for ongoing and future trials investigating new transcatheter mitral valve repair and replacement technologies. Thank you very much. Well, uh, uh, that was a really nice talk by Greg. And uh, I think the, the impact of the um, COAP and Mitra France uh, studies uh, really, um, it's not just about the results, but also in helping us shape our understanding of uh, proportionate and disproportionate MR. So we have about 10 minutes for discussion. And maybe, um, can I ask the panelists whether there are any questions that, that, uh, that you have for this or for just to discuss between the Mitra FR and the COAP studies. So uh, uh, KK, first uh, I'd like to just say thank you again to Greg because he was very prompt. Uh, he's a very hardworking chair, I must say. He uh, delivered the lecture when I asked him and he was the first to submit a recording. So again, and we are very appreciative for Greg for doing the COAP trial as well because it really changed practice, I think across the world and uh, our understanding as well. So we thank him uh, for that. Um, if I may ask the panel also and KK yourself, uh, he spoke again about proportionate, disproportionate MR, and he spoke so eloquently about it. But in our consensus statement, he spoke against it to uh, use as a criteria. Maybe you'd like to flesh out uh, his concerns again, uh, why uh, proportionate versus disproportionate is not a great concept to triage patient into this procedure. So um, thanks for the question, uh, uh, Jack. And I, I was trying to figure out how to, to put it into today's discussion. So I, I think the, the concept of uh, proportionate and disproportionate MR is meant as a conceptual framework for us to understand the disease. Um, it's, we should use it in practice, but what I think he meant we shouldn't use are the absolute numbers that are shown as the means uh, in the both studies. So we shouldn't use um, the, uh, say, for example, the end diastolic volume uh, uh, mean in the COEP or the Mitrofran study, Mitrofra study to triage which patients should or should not get treated with the Mitroclip. He was quite clear that that would not serve the patient well because, as you saw from the uh, boxes or the, uh, the diagrams uh, that he showed, there is a substantial overlap of patients in both categories. So a patient who may not meet exactly at the, at the mean or the median uh, may, may still benefit from it. So it is a conceptual framework, not uh, we shouldn't use the absolute numbers in those trials um, to, to determine whether it is proportionate or disproportionate. And to be honest, I think that that really makes sense to us. Maybe I can ask uh, uh, Si Hui as an equipo cardiologist, what are your thoughts on those, on, on that particular uh, framework? Hi, um, everyone, and very good afternoon to this very enlightening and important uh, topic. And I think as you were saying it in my mind, I just imagine seeing a patient that we will discuss whether this is proportional versus disproportional MR. And I would maybe paint an example where you have a patient with very enlarged left ventricle, and then in that sort of patient versus someone who has relatively small left ventricle that you know it doesn't get you by surprise that this is not too weak left ventricle. Why do I say that? It is not easy for us to 
really um, accurately quantify left ventricular volumes on our day-to-day -day, um, echo assessment. This is particularly more important for those with very enlarged left ventricle because there will be dropout, there may be what we call uh, difficulty in aligning the left ventricle to get the full volume. And a lot of time in these trials, they were really taken as a biplane measurements. And biplane means you take an assumptions that you take the four chamber and two chamber and do calculations. And you can imagine LV that is very dilated. This is not an accurate way of assessment. Even in the advent of having a 3D measurements of volumes, I think that itself meant a difficulty because of the endocardium uh, uh, borders uh, diminutions. So I would say for the intents of normal day-to-day -day practice, volume is a good surrogate. It gives you an idea how big with respect to the effective orifice area, which is the um, uh, regurgitation volume, that give you an assessment of what is relative. But I do agree with Greg that an absolute number, which they analyze, I think in the multi real analysis, that if volume is more than, if I remember correctly, 95 index uh, volume and diastole, that is too big for MR to be effectively um, reduced with a clip to have a good outcome. So I do agree because of measurements on echo that is difficult in day-to-day -day practice. Having said that, I think when it comes to quantifications, when we are not sure of the severity, um, MR quantification should be done uh, regularly, especially when it's moderately to severe because you want to give an absolute number of which way it's going, so we follow the guidelines. But when it comes to volume quantification to left ventricle, I think this is where this is a, a bit of a judgment call. I'm not sure whether the rest of the echo persons uh, actually will agree with me, but this is something that I would uh, suggest that we don't go by the book. Greg and uh, Alex, uh, you know, um, see we, uh, you know, mentioned that and uh, on the echo side, would you all agree? Yeah. Maybe Alex first. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, KK. Uh, thank you for having me first. So uh, I agree with uh, both you and uh, Sihui about um, uh, the notion that uh, we should not take like a certain absolute uh, value of ERO or, or LVN diastolic volume to be a cutoff for uh, excluding or including a patient who may be a, a candidate for mitral clip. It's all a um, concept. And uh, the, I think we, we agree that the more severe the MR, uh, the more likely the patient will benefit, and the and the less severe is the LV disease or dilatation, maybe the more likely the patient will, will have an improved prognosis after mitral clip. But we don't know whether it is because of the so-called proportionate or disproportionate, because there are several other ways to explain it. Uh, one is patients with a more diseased LV, uh, they're less likely. You know, their prognosis is poorer if they have a irreversible. Okay, fibrosis or infarct of the LV, no matter what you do, even if it's severe MR uh, with, a, with a successful reduction of MR, they probably do uh, less well. That's not because the MR is proportionately or disproportionately severe. It's simply because the LV is too sick. Uh, just like we exclude patients with uh, EF uh, less than 30% to go to surgery, even they have severe degenerative MR, according to the American guidelines. So, I think the concept is still worth further exploring how to explain uh, the difference between the mitral LVR and the CREP trials. But I think generally we agree with the fact, with the notion that more severe the MR and less severe is the LV dysfunction, more likely the patients will benefit. Another point I would like to make is uh, we see um, some patients uh, with atrial functional MR. Those patients, they tend to have um, normal ejection fraction, and uh, they have um, mitral annular dilatation and uh, sometimes severe functional MR. Those patients uh, are not adequately, they are not represented well in both the COAP and the mitral FL trial. But if we think about that, those are those patients really have a so-called disproportionately severe MR because they have severe MR, ERO is big, but the LV volume is normal. So if the concept of uh, what just Greg mentioned is uh, correct, then these atrial F MR patient may be uh, also good and even maybe better candidate for mitral club. And uh, we certainly wait for some uh, data and trial to, 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 
to, to tell us the answer. But in practice, I don't know. Uh, I also want you to know what you what would you guys do? But in 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 our institution, we also do metroclip for atrial function in our patients who are symptomatic, and we find that the 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 the, the benefit in terms of the symptoms is actually um, uh, uh, is actually good in some of these patients. Thanks, Alex. Uh, you know, uh, you know, maybe I would like to hear from David uh, as a heart failure uh, specialist. Um, you know, with the coab and mitral FRIs, uh, you know, I'd be very uh, interesting to hear what are your thoughts, uh, you know, uh, on this part two trials. Uh, so, as a heart failure specialist, uh, when we look at the how we interpret the mitral FR and the coab, I, I think it it just show us that patient selection is very important for a favorable outcome post mitral clip. So we keep on hearing about this uh, proportional and this proportional uh, this proportional MR. But I think the heart failure guide we like to use the word uh contract out, you know, uh, reserve. So when I look at a patient, uh, first thing I look at a patient is I will first uh, I agree with, with uh, Alex, what he said just now. A lot of time we like to do uh, MRI as well, you know, to look at the volume as well of the heart. At the same time, uh, look at the, uh, you know, quantify the myocardium. If I see the myocardium, a lot of fibrous tissue, you know, all infected or, you know, all fib uh, fibrotic. That group of patients, I think predominantly, if let's say the problem is a cardiomyopathy and the heart is huge, 8, 9 cm kind of patient, probably will not benefit as much from mitral clip. Whereas somebody where, you know, the uh, hardly any fibrosis, especially those patients with, uh, I agree with Alex, uh, even though not much data out there, but in theory, you think of it, the atrial so-called MR was, you know, supposedly should benefit more from the mitral clip. So we tend to look at the contractile reserve and uh, one key question I always ask myself, does this patient qualify for a heart transplant or LVAD? If the answer is yes, then I think the patient should just go for LVAD or transplant. Are the patients not sick enough for LVAD or transplant? But yet I know, you know, after, after optimizing the medical therapy, they are still not quite there yet. I think that group probably will be the sweet spot for mitral clip. Thanks, David. Um... I think at this point in time, maybe we should move to the second talk. Uh, Kentaro, uh, will you uh, kindly uh, help with the introductions? So, um, Kentaro, can you help introduce? Yeah, uh, yeah sure, yeah. So I think the Takashi presentation, right? Okay, I'd like to uh, introduce the uh, Dr. Takashi Masumoto from Sendai Kosa Hospital. And uh, actually he's a top runner for the uh, Macho Group in Japan, and not only in Japan, but also in Asia. And uh, today he's gonna talk about the uh, initial experience of the uh, Macho Group in Japan. So Takashi, please start. Thank you for uh, introduction, Kentaro. Uh, could you start my recorded Lecture, Samantha. I'm Takashi Matsumoto from Sendai Kose Hospital. Today I will present the uh, current situation of mitral clip in Japan. This slide shows a uh, clinical history of, of mitral clip. First IMA was 2003, then CMAC was approved in 2008. Then in, in US, it's approved for DMR in 2013, then FMR in 2009, 2019. In Japan, AVJ514 trial was performed in 2015. Based on the result, it approved in Japan in 2018. AVJ514 trial included 30 cases in six centers. Primary efficacy endpoint, it acute procedure of success, it was 86.7%. Then primary safety endpoint, it defined major adverse event at 30 days, it was 0%, death was zero and also stroke and MI was zero. Then at one year follow-up, one patient died, so one year mortality was 3.3%. This slide shows uh, device-related complications through one year. 
there was no device embolization, but one, uh, one SLD, SLD occurred. So the results of this trial mainly show the safety profile of, of mitral clip in Japanese populations. It was very nice. It looks too good. Of course, main re uh, one reason is sample size is small. It's just 30 patients. 30 patient. And also, uh, it's performed in selected six centers. But I think one uh, main reason is that we learn tips, tips and tricks from Western countries before we start did a trial. Personally, I worked with CyberCow for three years from 2011 to 2013. We, I learned a lot from him. So when we started the trial, we already knew what we should do and what, what we should not do. Then after this trial, uh, MitroClip was approved in Japan in 2018, and this slide shows a uh, indication at that moment. It approved for both DMR and FMR with ejection fraction equal or over 30%. After approval, number of MitroClip increases year by year. It's reached uh, 500, 500 cases in December 2018, 1,000 cases in July 2019, 2,000 cases in June this year. And these first 500 cases were included in post-market surveillance. This is a result. If a FMR patient was 71.6%, it's dominant, same as other countries. And the acute procedure of success was achieved in 91.1%. MR severity uh, was uh, two plus or less in 93.6% at discharge and 92.8% at 30 days follow up. Then uh, heart failure symptom, in a way, HF functional class, it was class one or two in 93.4% at discharge, then 94.2% at 30 days for up. And this thread shows a major adverse event at 30 days. Its mortality was just 2.4%. So, and after, uh, a co-opt trial, it has huge impact also in Japan, Japanese uh, indication. Uh, initial indication was if ejection fraction was equal or over 30%, but now based on co -opt trial, it expanded. It was ejection fraction was equal or over 20%. So in Japan, uh, indication was expanded and also number of cases increased year by year. But we are also facing some challenges of mitral grip. Main uh, challenges are these two stuff, uh, mit mitral grip G4 and tricuspid regurgitation. Mitral grip G4, G4 has four types of uh, grips, MT and MT wide and XT. It has longer arm and XTW. Of course, with these four types, types of grip, we can provide a tailor-made therapy for MR patient. But at the same time, I feel uh, decision-making becomes a little bit complex, like uh, which device we should use, uh, standard one or long arm or wide, wide arm. Then when uh, uh, independent grasping needed. So, I feel learning curve is very important to start this uh, MitoClip G4 successfully. So this uh, report says uh, improvement of procedure quality was observed up to 200, 200 cases. But unfortunately in Japan, no center reached 200 cases. So systematic training program, mainly based on web because of uh, COVID, it is just try, training course is very important to launch uh, MitroGrip G4 in Japan. And tricuspid regurgitation, some uh, MR patient has a concomitant tear 
in those pa in those patient, even after uh, mitral clip for MR, those patient develops right heart uh, right heart failure even after procedure. So in trial minute trial, it's evaluated uh, safety and efficacy of triclip for TR. It showed a significant reduction of TR after procedure. And in some other countries, my, uh, off label use of mitral clip for TR were reported. But unfortunately, unfortunately in Japan, off label, off -label use is very restricted. So I hope we can start a triclip trial in Japan near future. This is summary slide. So AVJ Japan trial, uh, AVJ 542 trial Japan trial was conducted in 2015, then approved for both DMR and FMR at, at the same time in 2018. After approval, uh, a number increased year by year, and it's now over uh, 2000, 2,000 cases, and also inclusion uh, indication was expanded. But we are also facing uh, some challenges of mitral grip in Japan. It was a successful start of a mitral grip G4 and also a treatment for tract cuspid regurgitation. This is conclusion slide. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Takash, for your uh, comprehensive presentations. So actually, the, we started the mitral clip uh, procedure together with Takashi in 2015 and uh, reimbursed uh, in 2018. And uh, our PMS data shows 91% of APS and the functional mitral reversion was included in 70%. And we have done 2,000 of cases. And now we are going to start the generational full device from uh, next September. So uh, is there any questions or comments? Uh, yes, Chuck, please. So um, that was, uh, again, fantastic. Again, it's amazing to see those numbers coming out of Japan. And uh, I, I think the COAP trial really helped a lot as well. Can I just ask, based on your learning curve, it's not just the procedures, it's also the echocardiologist learning curve. And therefore, I think there uh, is a lecture point at 50 to 100 to 200. And I, I'm also equally concerned about adding complexity to choices and all this. So would you recommend that centers not move on to the G4 until they cross a certain number, for example, um, of cases? That that is a good question, Jack. Um, can you hear me? It's my mic is on light. So um, ideally, I feel uh, before we move to uh, some uh, mitral G four, we need to treat some fifty or sixty cases. Of course, the learning uh, this paper says that the learning curve uh, can uh, can be seen up to uh, 200, 200 cases, but it's it's too huge. I think it's very huge number. So, but personally, I think after 50 cases, the quality of procedure become very stable. So, the, maybe the number is 50. I personally think it's 50, but it depends on the situation of each country. I agree. And, um, mm. you know, the, the numbers uh, so. that we were allowed to have before we were allowed to proctor was 50. Mm. And, um, I, I would say that uh, it's not just uh, uh, the implanter's experience, but it's also the echocardiologist's experience and not just the echocardiologist's experience, but the entire heart team and interactions uh, experience because there has to be a very strong level of uh, trust. And, you know, in our team, uh, both Jack and Sihui um, and uh, David, uh, when we discuss cases, uh, that there's a very strong level of trust and understanding as to what we should and cannot do um, so I, I would say that um, the, a number is just one part of it, but it's more than that. I but actually, agree. I'm cu yeah. curious to hear what uh, Chrisada's uh, experiences in terms of numbers. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding uh, what, what would be a, a good number uh, in terms of uh, getting uh, you know, that, that nice, you know, I think 200 is really quite a stretch. Um, uh, what number would you quote? Thank you for the question. Yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with uh, Dr. Takashi because uh, 200 cases is very huge. Uh, in Thailand, we 
just getting slowly. And I think that 200 cases of the number uh, hard to get in our country. I think uh, 30 cases to 50 cases should be uh, good for team uh, by the interventionist and echocardiologist to uh, understand the, the procedure, understand the disease and, and see the difficult situation or some complication and I know how to uh, manage the, that complication or the difficult situation. I think uh, for in our country, I think 30 cases or 50 cases should be a good number. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for the comment. So actually, uh, we had a really big discussion in the Japanese module clip uh, committee and uh, for introduction of generation four device, uh, maybe we need to have the uh, good number of experience, but we also have the uh, some issue with the Gliperi, uh with G2 uh, devices, which is currently used in Japan. And our committee decided to introduce a generation four devices as soon as possible for the uh, already opened 59 centers until the end of December. And hopefully the, uh, the device will be uh, safely introduced in Japan. Because G4 devices, as you know, have the uh, uh, feature like the individual grasping, uh, which may lead to the, uh, a little bit the, uh, the difficult situation. So uh, hopefully the, uh, the new device will be safely introduced in Japan very soon. So uh, questions and comments? Yeah, Kakashi. Uh, Jeff, please. Yeah. Uh, the observation about TR, I want to hear from the panel, whether it's Adam, uh, Gregory, or anyone about TR, because in our center, in our experience, it seems to work quite well, especially the XTR on board. If we can see the valve and we can grasp it, it's very nice, actually. And surprisingly, not as terrifying as we first believe it to be. But, uh, but I, I uh, again, we don't have that many cases done, yeah. but when it's done, it's beautiful. Um, yeah. I was wondering what are your thoughts on the number or TR, because I'm sure the number will be less than even MR, right? I would say. You're you asking me or Adam? Yeah, uh, yourself uh, first, and maybe uh, you from Gregory of and course, Adam. Of, yeah. of course, I know you're in your center, uh, KK uses a mitral clip for as of regular use for TR, but as I said, it's I want to use, use it, but it's very strict by Japanese PMDA. So uh, personally, uh, when we see a uh, concomitant severe TR, patient with concomitant severe TR, so I usually send those patients to uh, surgery. surgery, yeah. But I'm not sure exact number and the exact proportion. So we are doing you... mainly surgical reject, but the result has been, I mm. would say, very, very good. Yeah. Uh, can I Some... hear from the surgeons or anyone on the panel about their views? Actually, when I when I treat uh, uh, I treat two or three patients who uh, has a concomitant severe TR, those patients develop a right heart failure after procedure. Adam, do you have any comment? Yeah, I think I, I only also, uh, only have this experience uh, using my to treat patients with uh, concomitant tricuspid resuscitation. But I think. Uh, a population with already with concomitant mitral and also tricuspid diseases uh, to procedure evaluation is very important. So, I what you have mentioned that you after uh, you treat the patient with uh, CVMR, I believe majority of patient would hope that the, the RV will forget benefit when you you know mitigate the mitral resuscitation, given that the the post you know the post capture palmitation related to the mitral resuscitation is very essential to impact on the right ventricular function. But for the majority of patients who have uh, not only concomitant tricuspid resuscitation, but also the right ventricle has been dilated. We, according uh, by our uh, previous experience, even when we treat TR, we can abolish all the uh, mitral valve, uh, mitral resuscitation. The patients still have a uh, persistent, uh, significant moderate severe tricuspid resuscitation. So. For, uh, for very specific patient who have not only concomitant TR, but also have a already dilated right ventricle, I, I think the, the simultaneous treatment for tricuspid resuscitation is very essential. 
So I have the same experience with you that when I have a patient with concomitant mitral and trichotic disease, I will encourage the patient to get uh, a surgery. But you know, the majority of the patient who uh, who were seeking for mitral procedure is because they have very high surgical risk. So for those patients, I would do try to do the pre-procedure evaluation. If the the layer are not really significant tri uh, gap uh, between the trichotic block, then indicate using the STR system, we are able to uh, get a very great, uh, a good grasping and to reduce the TR by two click, which is what have uh, Dr. Cyberka already mentioned that you just need to click the septal to anterior and septal to posterior, only two clicks. Uh, only to click, you can mitigate all majority of the TR. So mm -hmm. for me, if patient who is a uh, concomitant TR, but right ventricle is not really dilated, I will treat the MR alone, and then the majority of the patient will get uh, improvement in trichotic situation. But for those who already who did, uh, not only have a severe TR, but also dilated uh, right ventricle, I would do the concomitant procedure because I think by our experience, those patients might, not, might still have persistent severe TR and also uh, have late symptoms. I agree, and, Adam. So yeah, you know, for, for, for our experience with the uh, tricuspid, um, the isolated ones that we, we had to do were those where they had really significant symptoms. Uh, for example, recurrent ascites requiring you know, almost weekly admissions or those um, uh, who are very debilitated in which uh, they, you know, for example, we had our first case was a combined uh, MRTR case uh, that had gone around to three hospitals, uh, couldn't get out of three different hospitals. And then when we were asked to do the case, you know, after that procedure for one year, uh, and I think longer than one year, did not have to be readmitted. So I think, you know, like what David said with the MR cases, uh, patient selection is probably the key. Mm -hmm. Uh, the ones that we may not want to do are like the ones you described, those that are too late. And I think we continue to learn uh, which patients are ideal. The, the other point that I thought maybe regarding TR that Jack nicely brought up is the fact that uh, the other elephant in the room is imaging. And imaging, if it is not good, then we are in trouble. So I, you know, we are very fortunate that... Uh, and, and, and here you have three great echo cardiologist. So maybe just to bounce a question to Greg. Um, Greg, uh, what are your thoughts about imaging for TR? So it's absolutely true that if you can't see it, you can't do it. And I think that we learned and uh, that an X-plane approach, uh, so in, a, in the short axis aortic uh, base of heart view, uh, X-plane onto that will give you a beautiful septo anterior with the X-plane if you move to the lateral. Uh, sorry, towards the, uh, the left of the TV, you'll get septo posterior. You look whereabouts along that coaptation line. I think I've got actually up there in the background. But that's that that short axis view is a is a bi basically a bicommissural view of the uh, of the tricuspid. And doing 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 that has basically saved the day for us because, as Adam said, it's mostly septo anterior. And once you get the hang of that and put the clip as close as you can to that septo anterior point, that actually uh, has in the majority of our cases uh, been the solution. Having said that, we're still just doing mitrals first on, and coming back another day. We've only done one on the fly, bo uh, uh, both. So we mostly, uh, uh, this is of the mixed. Of the mixed ones, we do the mitral first. And while we're in the neighborhood, see how good the tricuspid imaging is and, and then come back another day. Now the isolated ones are another thing. And we've, we've, got, we've got a whole bunch of them stockpiled, ready to go. We've been stalled a little bit because of COVID. But we're, we've got uh, at least a dozen of those people lined up, ready to go. Now, my concern about these is because uh, from our from our original proctoring, it looked like the big clip was the was the way to go here. But I'm concerned that the tri clip thing is the smaller clip uh, coming through. So we're going to have to get our heads around that because the big clip you need the big arms mostly to to grab these uh, leaflets. Uh, the other thing is that um, you need to spend a bit of time thinking about your anatomy. With, these, with this imaging and uh, Alex did some beautiful pencil diagrams of the anatomy uh, because uh, the, the, it's, not, it's, it's not exactly what you think. And in particular, in the basal short axis view of the aortic valve, like I've got up there behind me, that's, that's the anterior leaflet. And so you've got to get your head around the anatomy a bit. And I think we've got, as we're proctoring this, we're going to have to get this out to our, 
our community of people because um, as you said, Jack, it's actually not that scary. You just a, It's just a bunch of eye-hand coordinations that we have to get our heads around, which we got our heads around with Mitral. Uh, and I, I actually think it's probably not that scary at all. And I agree with you, KK, the intractable societies people um, is where you don't want to get to that when they've got malnutrition and societies requiring drainage every year. And what we're doing is we're lining up people who are actually not quite that end stage uh, at the sort of pre-torrential level a uh, bit, bit more prospectively, because it's a pretty easy procedure for the person, unlike tricuspid valve replacement, which is a very difficult procedure for people. You probably need to hear from uh, John, the surgeon, since uh, we are trying to take away too many business from you. So yeah. hear your point about tricuspid and mitral here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jack. Uh, I agree with the comment so far. The, the tricuspid valve, about half the tricuspid regurgitation will get better if you correct the mitral regurgitation. So if you're not doing surgery but doing mitral clip, I think it's sensible to stage it. Just do the mitral clip first and then observe because half of them, the tricuspid regurgitation will improve. And these are the patients who have very severe mitral regurgitation, say ERO of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and also raise pulmonary artery pressure. So a lot of these patients I find uh, some, some of, in surgery, we, we would normally repair the tricuspid at the same time, but we have some patients uh, with very severe MR, very high PA pressure, and the RV function is moderate in whom we have not uh, addressed the tricuspid because you're a bit concerned of closing off the tricuspid valve in very high PA pressure, say it's about more than two-thirds systolic. So I find that in a lot of these patients, the TR actually gets better once you correct the mitral valve. But if the MR is not too bad, let's say it's severe MR, ER 0.6, the PA pressure is not too high, and the TR, is, the tricuspid analyst is very dilated, those patients, the, the TR do not tend to get better. So those you do need to repair, definitely need to repair uh, at the time of surgery. And But but you have the advantage of mitral clip, you can stage it, you don't have to do it at the same time. So I think it's a very sensible approach which Professor Gregory Scalia suggested to stage the the procedures just do the mitral clip first and then watch the tricuspid if it's still significant patient is still symptomatic then you could you could do the tricuspid uh, at a later sitting the the issue is always cost uh, the dry by shooting we probably have to uh, probably define it a bit more about which cases uh, will benefit from a simultaneous procedure i, I think a second dry by is really too expensive for us uh, so we we are also slowly i think KK reminded me last just this Tuesday, it was our seventh tricuspid and it was a drive-by. And um, I, I think people can explore. I think you will enjoy it uh, once it's come to Japan in a big way. And uh, we hope to see those cases come to Japan as well. Um, I think in the interest of time, we're going to move on to the last uh, lecture. So uh, in APSC, we have started an initiative of gathering a consensus and a good consensus uh, that we have had our second meeting will be an APIC consensus uh, statements and endorsement for the use of mitral clip for MR, uh, led by KK, Takashi, and myself. So uh, KK uh, will present on behalf of this group. I think a lot of you in the panel are uh, uh, KOLs within this consensus statement. Thanks, KK. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit of uh, the APSC consensus statements on the use of uh, mitral clip for MR. Um, so these are the hospitals, the cardiologists, and the uh, specialties that uh, have participated in this uh, particular program. There are 27 of us, and uh, there are definitely experts outside this uh, group of, uh, of uh, 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 cardiologists, but we, were, we had to assemble them and uh, bring them together, so it wasn't uh, always easy. <clears throat> this is the second list, and you can see a good mix of... Uh, interventional cardiologists, echocardiologists, cardiac surgeons, uh, heart failure specialists. And of note, uh, we also involved uh, Greg Stone, uh, whom you heard of from earlier on uh, from the US, especially given his uh, seminal work with uh, COAPT, and also Joanne Lindenfeld, who is also a, a cardiologist, a, a heart failure specialist uh, from Vanderbilt um, in the US, and also a co-investigator in the COAPT study. Um, <clears throat> what I'm sharing right now are preliminary uh, consensus statements because we are still uh, um, looking at the results uh, of the uh, discussions, but they form, uh, I think, an early understanding of what we have with the therapy uh, in Asia. So maybe just a bit of an overview. Uh, we ask each of the uh, authors to, to essentially vote on these statements. 
And um, if we have 100% agreement, then it's a consensus. If it's, uh, you know, 95 to 99% agreement, it's moderate. And if it is uh, 90 to 95% that's weak, but consensus. And of course, if there's less than 90%, then there is no consensus. As you can imagine, this is a quite a high bar that we have uh, uh, put for ourselves. And this is a good thing, uh, I think, in this region. So the first is that uh, we agreed on uh, some uh, representative uh, diagrams. And you can see here a diagram showing uh, what the regression volume would be, what the Wiener contractor would be, and what the EROA should be in severe mitral regurgitation. In addition, uh, we have put in a table which reflects uh, current uh, ASE guidelines uh, in terms of what constitutes uh, mild, moderate, and severe MR, as well as what we we'll consider what we would consider abnormal or dysfunctional uh, parameters for left atrial size, pulmonary artery systolic pressure, left ventricular and systolic diameter, and uh, LVEF. So these uh, uh, numbers serve as reference points for which we can discuss a particular MR case. Now, first, we address the mitral clip use in degenerative MR. And uh, this was the first statement, um, and that is both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients with more than or equal to 3 plus DMR who meet the indications for surgery but are considered high risk by the heart team should be considered for mitral implantation with strong level of consensus. Well, there was weak level of consensus for this uh, statement, and I think that's uh, 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 you know, uh, interesting to note, but nonetheless, uh, this is uh, where we are today. Uh, the second statement in the context of patients who are referred for mitral clip, uh, mitral clip use should be considered for symptomatic DMR with or without reduced EF. Uh, the level of consensus is weak for this statement as well. <clears throat> for statement number three, mitral clip use may be considered for asymptomatic patients with more than or equal to three plus DMR with reduced LVEF and or LV dilatation or new onset atrial fibrillation or pulmonary hypertension. Again, the level of consensus is weak. Um, before I move on to fMR, you will notice that for the prior statements on degenerative MR, the consensus is weak. And I think that perhaps reflects um, the strong um, use of uh, uh, cur the current strong uh, role of surgery in the treatment of DMR in this region. And uh, that's something that uh, our community and our region uh, continue to, will continue to uh, learn and evolve with. Now, moving on to mitral clip use in functional MR, uh, FMR. So the first statement is that FMR patients should receive at least one month of optimized guideline-directed medical therapy with reasonable attempts to up titrate treatment as well as cardiac re resynchronization therapy uh, with CRTD, if warranted, before being evaluated for further intervention or mitral clip uh, use. Again, the level of consensus is weak. We had a a good debate about the, some of the language. Um, should we use the word reasonable attempts or exhausted all attempts, uh, optimize? Uh, these were words that we had debated uh, long and hard within the committee. But nonetheless, this is where we are. The level of consensus is weak um, and represents the ongoing uh, debate and uh, research in this area. Uh, statement number five, FMR patients should be monitored regularly and referred early to the heart team, which would include a mitral clip specialist, a heart failure specialist, echocardiologist and surgeon for, mitro, for potential mitral clip implantation. Discussions and endorsements of utility should be deferred to the heart team. And this was uh, good to see that there was a strong level of consensus. And uh, again, uh, highlights our evolving uh, knowledge and uh, experience in this region. And just to remind everyone, the strong level of consensus means that pretty much everyone agreed. Statement number six, uh, FMR patients who do not meet the eligibility criteria for mitral clip implantation, uh, such as those uh, stated in these examples, should be closely monitored. These patients should be considered for mitral clip implantation once the eligibility criteria are met. The level of consensus for this was strong. And again, um, I think this is still an evolving field, but nonetheless, um, you know, gratifying to see that people have share these thoughts. Statement number seven, Symptomatic patients with more than or equal to 3 plus FMR should be assessed by the heart team for possible mitral clip implantation. And this is a nice statement, I think, probably on the strength of the COAP trial. Uh, and again, I think we chose words carefully, assessed by the heart team for possible. We're not saying it should, must be done, but just for possible mitral clip implantation. 
And these are, uh, again, uh, reassuring. And I think the COAP trial seriously did uh, you know, uh, help us make that decision. Now, the technical considerations for the mitral clip, uh, we uh, wanted to provide some guidance uh, to, the, to, to our colleagues in terms of what would be ideal and what would be complex and what would be inappropriate um, uh, you know, anatomical um, factors in, in selecting a patient for mitral clip. You can see learning from the Everest 2 study that uh, the, the, ideal, the ideal case would be if the MR had a pathology in segment 2 uh, and if the valve area was more than 4.0 cm squared. Uh, and of course, if the patient had leaflet perforation, active in the infective endocarditis, uh, moderate to severe mitral stenosis, or the presence of a left atrial thrombus, they would be inappropriate. And in between, we had patients with complex pathology, but which we could still consider. Uh, those with pathology in uh, medial or lateral segments, a uh, short uh, posterior mitral, uh, uh, posterior leaflet length, ballos uh, disease, uh, cleft leaflets, severe calcification, prior annuloplasty, and even rheumatic uh, leaflet thickening were felt to be complex and by themselves not uh, exclusions for the use of the clip. Now, this flow chart uh, again had a lot of uh, very uh, informative debate. Um, this was the assessment and initial management of uh, patients with uh, more than or equal to three plus FMR. Uh, you can see that uh, we wanted to make sure that the coronary anatomy and, uh, uh, and, and or ischemic evaluation was performed with revascularization if appropriate. And then obviously we needed a heart failure specialist to help optimize medical therapy plus minus CRTD. And if there was persistent uh, more than three plus or equal to three plus FMR, then we should reevaluate uh, uh, for possible mitral clip uh, implant uh, eligibility and assessment. Uh, this would uh, we made a statement about the use of TEE for defining etiology and transthoracic echo for assessing severity, especially in these patients. Um, bearing in mind uh, Adam's uh, earliest uh, statement uh, about uh, uh, or Alex's earlier statements for atrial fMR. We also address subgroups and special populations for mitral clip. Uh, these were the atrial FMR, concomitant MRTR, acute MR, and uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. And statement eight um, uh, included one of these groups, uh, that is patients with symptomatic atrial FMR should be evaluated by the heart team, which should include the electrophysiologist and heart failure specialist. Um, and if treatment had already been optimized, mitral clip may be considered there was a strong level of consensus for this. And I suspect that is because there really wouldn't be many other options available for these patients. Uh, statement nine uh, is as follows. The expert panel acknowledges that the mitral clip has been used in less common scenarios, such as what I described earlier, with reasonable reports of clinical success. However, enrollment into clinical trials or registries is preferred. And patients with these less common conditions should be evaluated by the heart team on a per patient basis with informed patient consent on the limited understanding available to determine whether the mitral clip use would be feasible and beneficial for them. There was a strong level of consensus for these two statements. So with that, I come to the end of the uh, list of uh, consensus statements. And again, I want to remind everyone that the um, and these statements re remain preliminary uh, pending the final uh, committee meeting. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it's a good start for our region that we can come together, discuss the issues across sub-disciplines and come up with a list of nine consensus statements. So I'm very grateful for everyone's participation uh, in this and my co-chairs, uh, 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 Jack and uh, Takashi, uh, for helping to lead this. And I think, uh, again, uh, I'm, I think we look forward to the eventual publication of this document. Thank you. Thanks, KK. Uh, again, a wonderful effort. And again, thanks for all of the co-authors there. And uh, thanks for providing your poll numbers. So we, we set a high bar because we also understand that this is a consensus. It's not evidence-based, but if we find gaps, we hope that uh, we can have uh, registries or research just concentrate on our own Asian patients. Uh, to address those needs. Maybe I can ask uh, again on this topic. Do you think there's any, I mean, all of us train with this uh, device in the Western Caucasian country moving to Asia. Do you think there's anything that 
is more peculiar in the procedure in Asians compared to the Caucasian group uh, or Caucasian patients. Any observation, whether it's on echo, whether it's on preference, whether it's on the procedure? So both, uh, maybe Chris, uh, Mimo, we want to give that a try, since both you and Takashi train with uh, uh, Cybo. Yes, thank you for the question. Yeah, we, uh, in Thailand, we saw the problem with a, a small left atrial dimension. You know, for the NT system, we need uh, this uh, puncture height around 4 or 4.5, but uh, in my practice, it, Hard to get just four is the hard. We we can get like a maximum like a 3.8, 3.9. But I think we, we still can do the procedure with the uh, slightly lower set of puncture. And uh, and the, the next uh, the next problem is uh, we saw uh, many patients with the uh, uh, P3 lesion uh, for the uh, DMR patient in our hospital, uh, half of the patient, the lesion is on the P3, not the P2, like we found in the US or Western country. I don't know uh, uh, other, other uh, panel uh, see that uh, fighting I, also. Actually, that's a very uh, interesting yeah. point because, uh, you know, our uh, uh, Abbott, um, uh, rep uh, Dermot uh, told us that uh, you are the king of uh, medial uh, disease, you know. So I, I'm curious. Uh, I don't. I think we have quite a lot of medial disease, in, and I get very irritated with them because you know you got to have a high puncture and then you struggle a little bit to steer it. So I'm curious. Is it the same in in uh, you know other parts of Asia too? Maybe uh, Takashi. Is that your experience as well? Um, oh. Of course, sometimes uh, I treat uh, media side or radar side, but main I f I think main re uh, region is A to P two. Oh, but I totally uh, totally agree that uh, in most of the case I cannot get a height in the uh, four chamber view. I mean, most of the case it's under four centimeter, and also uh, in Japan we sometimes face a very tortuous IVC, especially mm. elderly patient. So I feel I think we need to pay attention when we treat those uh, patients that there is a risk of IVC rupture. When once it happened, no way, no uh, no treatment option to save patient. And what about you? Is your experience? Uh, do you have the? Do you have a lot of uh, medial disease? Yeah, I, I think I have similar feeling as. Uh, uh, that's the, the, the media king in Thailand. That I also feel that we, we have a large proportion of patients who have BMI and also media disease. So I don't know why I did not really make the calculation, male less statistics. But I think actually it seems that the media and also majority of my BMI patients have media and also the central disease. But I just uh, think uh, my, by my personal experience, I, I, I from comparing to the Western and also the Asia, I, I think the puncture is not really an issue because majority of the patients who are seeking for uh, myotrical procedure, they have already very dilated uh, left atrium, uh, except for those who have acute MR post myocardial infarction or who have acute heart failure, myocarditis, they probably have smaller uh, atrium. We would get a high issue. But majority of the patients, we did not really uh, encounter high issue. But I think because we have a uh, you know, small body size, so I believe our mitral valve area should be less than, uh, small than the Western country. So for my uh, majority of my, our, our patients, especially for the elder lady, the older lady, when we treat the central H2P region, which we cause uh, very, uh, a lot of impact on the mitral valve area reduction. So we probably only have a single click a chance to mitigate all the mitral situation. I think maybe this is what I believe the major difference between the Western and, and Asia, for major Asia, especially for all AP, small area. So if we treat the central a 2 p 2 region, we probably have only you know, one clear chance. But if we treat non-central region, because it, uh, it proposed less impact on the mitral valve area reduction, so we can 
treat the non-central collision with even two or three clips without any uh, you know, area issue. But for central air tubule, I really, I, I actually, I did not like to treat central air tubule region, the, the, the pathology, because it caused you know, a lot of trend of um, the mitral valve area function. I tend to find when we treat people who start with a small valve area around four square centimeters and uh, you know the little ladies and so on, when you put the clip in, it doesn't make the gradient go too high because for them, even that reduced reduced uh, double orifice is for them still not that small of an orifice. And so it doesn't seem to put the gradient high. I think you, you know, if you see somebody, a big person, big Caucasian person who's got four square centimeters, they've usually got a thick, somewhat distorted, sclerosed valve, and that's gonna make a lot of MS quickly. But a little person who starts at four, if you make them 2.1 or something, it's not that stenotic for them, for their body surface area. Again, a wonderful uh, observation. Uh, I, I wanted to hear from uh, either Alex or John their impression of the consensus that KK presented. Um, do you have any uh, uh, comments? And also, John, where, when would the surgeons prefer to really refer the DMR patients for a clip? Maybe uh, John first. Uh, yeah, th thank you, Jack. Um, <clears throat> I think for DMR patients, I think as we heard from Greg Stone's uh, lecture that the the data still su supports surgical treatment because the risk of surgery is so low. It's about one percent for most uh, most mitral repairs for degen degenerative MR, and the Everest trial has shown that the results are much better with surgery. So the data is not there yet for mitral clip. But of course, with in patients who have very high risk for surgery, and the FDA used the word prohibitive risk for surgery then I think the mitral clip would, would be a good option because it's still better than just medical treatment. So if the patient is not going for surgery, then I think that those patients should be uh, considered for, for the mitral clip. But I see the mitral clip having a very uh, a strong role in the functional MR, especially if the co trial. But of course, we have to remember that the MR is just one component of the functional MR. The heart failure is very important. And... In, especially, I think nowadays we have newer heart failure treatment. I'm, I'm sure most of the patients in the co and the mitral FR trial were not on the ARNIS or on uh, uh, for SIGA, for example. So there are newer treatments as well. And also don't forget about the coronary disease uh, for those with functional ischemic MR because 60% of the patients in the mitral FR trial uh, were ischemic MR patients. And there was no requirement to address the uh, coronary disease in the mitral FR trial. Whereas in the co trial protocol, it very specifically says that the coronary disease has to be revascularized for at least three months prior to the mitral clip. So that, that I think is very important. So, and we have very established treatments for heart failure and coronary, coronary disease. So these two should probably be addressed first. Because in, mo in a lot of cases, in about half the cases, the MR will get better just with uh, coronary revascularization, if it's ischemic MR, and with heart failure treatment. And then in the other half, if the MR still persists, then I think the mitral clip would be uh, a very good treatment, as we, as we have seen from the co trial. So I think a few lessons for, for that. But for the degenerative MR, I think we still need to wait for... Uh, trials to show the benefit of uh, mitral clip. But certainly for those with prohibitive risks, uh, very high risk, the very frail patient, very elderly patients, for example, then I think the mitral clip would be a very suitable option for, for them. So John, Actually, maybe I, I would like to push you a little bit more. Yes. You know, in Asia, patients don't like surgery, even if you say it's 1% risk. So we know it's not as good in DMR, but I tell you it's also very safe in mitral clip, may recur in DMR. And how, how much should patients' preference come into play in Asia? I mean, you've got fantastic operators like uh, Takashi now, you know, you've got high volume. You've got pretty decent results, I must say, with not too bad durability, maybe not as good as surgery. So if I push you a little bit, not high prohibitive surgical risk, patient really want a clip, what, what, what is your take on that? Uh, I think... I think we also have to look at what the, the device is licensed for. So I, I don't know, I mean, the, the device at the moment is licensed by the FDA for those with prohibitive risk for surgery for degenerative MR. So whether we can use it if the risk is low, if the patient wants it, 
uh, I'm not so sure, but I think we also need a consensus from the heart team. So I mean, if the, the heart team feels it's not, not the right thing to do for the patient, then we need a proper discussion with the patient. But then we have to come down to, I don't know, if someone, if, if a device is not licensed for low risk degenerative MR, whether we can actually use it. Uh, but but the, of course, the, 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 the fact that the uh, FDA has said prohibitive, but they have not defined what prohibitive risk is. So that is, I think that the risk has to be fairly high, at least for the patient. If the risk is very low, then I think it, is, it may be a bit difficult to, to justify implanting the, the mitral clip, particularly when, if you read the IFU, the, the, contra the indications are, are listed very clearly, uh, which patients uh, should be appropriately treated with the mitral clip. Maybe I can uh, just uh, chime in here. You know, for, for our, unlike Takashi's experience, the majority of our patients, I think 60%, at our last analysis, maybe even 70% of all our mitral clip cases are degenerative MR cases. And they are always referred by surgeons. Almost always. Unless they happen to be my patients, but most times they are, they are referred by surgeons. So uh, I think that reflects you know, our, our shared understanding that this device, given its you know, its current, uh, you know, how do we put it, uh, regulatory approval as well as uh, global experience um, should be used only in high-risk uh, patients um, and uh, or prohibitive risk patients, um, depending on definitions. So so for that, I, I'm grateful. Um, Katakashi, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, uh, patient preference is very important. But honestly, I say if I see patient Severe DMR with severe DMR with uh, just standard risk. If even if patient want to uh, mitral clip, I send those patients to surgery. But uh, John uh, and not uh, Greg Stone uh, talked about uh, Ebers trial. Uh, the important thing is uh, is that uh, when Ebers trial was trial was conducted, the three D echo was not available at that moment. So now different from at that moment, we can use a 3D echo. So imaging uh, quality is surprisingly increased, uh, improved. So, so now we sometimes see a patient, uh, I mean DMR patient after CRIP, we sometimes see a very surgical-like result. Mainly those patients, uh, mainly uh, those main, uh, mainly those MRIs come from uh, A to P2 region. So in those type of MR, I think if patient uh, surgical risk is intermediate, maybe uh, patient benefit from mitral grip. So, okay. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for the comment. Uh, I'm always counting some of the time. It was a fantastic discussion, but it's coming to 90 minutes, believe it or not. So. Uh, I, I'd like to now take this opportunity to just go around the panel and I'd like uh, each panel to have their last word to give one take-home message for the participants who have stayed with us for 90 minutes. Uh, one point that you'd like them to learn from this session from your perspective. So maybe I can start with Alex, uh, if you don't mind. Hey. One point for the participants. So I, I think as an echocardiographer, I, I, I cannot emphasize uh, enough that the uh, the role of imaging uh, in the mitral clip and also tri clip and uh, I am um, uh, 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 responding to one of your uh, earlier questions about uh, our views on the statement consensus statement. I think we can uh, I humbly suggest that maybe we can add some uh, statements concerning the uh, imaging, like the uh, the competence or, or training level. What kind of uh, skill set uh, that uh, uh, we can recommend? To people who are doing the imaging for triclip, like um, competence level uh, recommendation for the imager, I think that that would be nice. Uh, we we have some consensus on that, and uh, congratulate on the uh, on the on, on the statement and this uh, very successful session. Thanks, Alex. A wonderful comment. So again, Alex, point great patient selection. We defer a lot of the imaging etiology to the echocardiologist. The point is taken for the guidance, but I think we decided not to because it's quite disparate in Asia because then you have to qualify for the implanters as well and it's a, it's a lot of qualifications there. John, 
Do you have a, a teaching point for? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's important to uh, consider the mitra clip as a very effective treatment for those who are at very high risk for surgery. So we now have an option to treat severe mitral regurgitation, all forms of severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, for degenerative mitral regurgitation who are too high risk for surgery, I think the mitral clip is a very good treatment. And for functional mitral regurgitation, once we have treated the heart failure and coronary disease, if they have two still symptomatic with significant mitral regurgitation, then I think the mitral clip is an option, uh, excellent treatment. So I think uh, uh, I'm very encouraged to, to see the progress of the mitral clip over the years. And with time, I think we will better define us as well the patients who will benefit more from, from the mitra clip. So uh, thank you for inviting me as a panelist. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, from the surgeon's perspective, that's nice to hear. There's a unmet, un, a met need that's filled by mitra clip for this group of patients, and we're happy for that as well. Uh, Professor Yu, your one teaching point. Siwi. Hi. I think from my journey learning microclip and in the imaging for the uh, structural work, I learned to actually appreciate tricuspid valve imaging because this is something that we have uh, neglect learning it very much in the, in the learning of uh, even uh, echocardiology or imaging. But as long as you are practicing it, I think it is a good thing. And the more you practice, the more you will actually visualize and appreciate the tricuspid anatomy very well. We learn from the surgical experience that tricuspid anatomy, we always look at the, what we call the septal lateral or the uh, annular dilatations. But for structural work, you need to go much in depth. You need to understand the three leaflets, how they co up. And then as what Greg Scully has said, our, well, what we call the uh, intercommissural view in the short axis, when you see this, the, the aortic valve, if you use an x plane, now we have a 3D imaging, you keep practicing, you will understand this anatomy so much better with the TART team, meaning you have to engage interventional cardiologists as well who is in your, um, in your team, because in that way, you can select the patients better. And I think this is important. The more you do, the better you are, then you are more prepared for triclips, because I think this is going to be the next um, uh, e-therapy for tricuspid valve regurgitations. Thanks, Siwi. If, if we can't see, you can't do anything. So we can't grow in the dark. So That's we need right. echocardiologists. Uh, Adam, your one point uh, for the participants. Uh, I, I, I cannot agree with uh, Alex uh, anymore that I believe the, the echocardiographer, I always believe that the echocardiographer are the soul of the mitral clip procedure because without their help, without their, the images, is not able to conduct the procedure. So I also agree with Alex that we, maybe we can uh, you know, uh, have consensus on the echocardiographic uh, imaging training, not only for the echocardiographer, but also for the intervention either, because it may help in, 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 when and the intervention understand the limitation of the echo images, and it would not only improve the, the procedure success for it, it can also improve when we know the limitation, we can know uh, why the echo image cannot be sometimes be improved or not. It would, you know, in, uh, you know improve the intimate relationship between the interventionist and also the, the echocardiographer. And also, I also believe that the, the surgeon is the, the one of the key person on doing mitral clip procedure because they are able to define whether the patient have true, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the prohibited surgical risk. So with their support, a team, uh, the, the heart team who can assist in mitral clip uh, procedure. And also I congrats uh, KK to chair and also Ted, uh, Jack to chair the very nice consensus meeting. Thank you for inviting Thanks. Thanks, David. Uh, David, your one point. Uh, so I think the key to, like I say, a successful mitral clip program is uh, patient selection. And I agree with uh, John that uh, the, for the degenerative, I think if the patient has low surgical risk, probably the data still favors surgery. But of course, the clip will be an excellent option for those with very high surgical risk. For the FMR, I just want to remind everybody that uh, not to forget GDMT, and I'm very glad that, that John, I'm very impressed with you as a surgeon. He did mention <laughs> Arnie and Foxiga, very up to date with heart failure treatment. So we do have to uh, understand that uh, the so called GDMT, the GoPro is always shifting. So in the CoEP and the Mitral FR, majority of them were just on ACE beta. 
But now, you know, we have ARNI, we have, uh, you know, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitor and very sigua. And the next couple of years, we're going to see more and more heart failure drug. And uh, as a heart failure specialist, we see a lot, a lot of functional MR. So those that eventually get referred to the mitral click team or the heart team, is only a small proportion of what we see. Because with good medical therapy, quite a substantial number of them, you will do see a reduction in the MR. Thanks, thanks, David. Great points. Greg? Two points. One is learn your X-plane. If you're an echo doctor doing this, you've got to be able to do X-plane. It's not intuitive uh, uh, straight up, but X-plane is everything in these procedures. And the second thing is, if you're sending your young ones off to do structural intervention fellowships, send your young ones to do structural echo fellowships because uh, you need core uh, dedicated training of your echo dudes just as much as your, as your cath, cath people um, and typically send them to a place like Cybal or with us or whatever, that's got dedicated we uh, dedicated echo teaching. We do a, after they finish their fellowship and then their echo fellowship, then they do the structural echo fellowships another whole year. Uh, and I think you need that level of sophistication for your echo folk, just like your cath people. So train the whole team. Uh, Takashi? So uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, including me in this uh, very nice uh, consensus document. It, this uh, consensus document it's very definitely very useful for uh, daily practice and uh, thank you very much and congratulations again for a uh, great work of KK thank you thanks uh, Kentaro so thank you again for the including me this into this uh, great collaboration and uh, I really feel that the uh, this consensus document is very reasonable and uh, very sensible and really useful for the daily practice and uh, in the future, we need to publish more and more data to make this consistent document more robust based on the uh, evidence. Thank you. Thanks. So we, we will depend on Japan to uh, kick out some more data soon. Krisada? Thank you so much. Uh, so I just want to uh, remark the importance of the hard team because uh, like a new center like us, uh, you cannot uh, go by yourself and you have to have a good team like a, uh, you have to good relation with the uh, surgeon and we have to learn together with your echo cardio uh, echo cardiogram and and you have to go with uh, your uh, heart failure especially i think it's good to have very good team in your hospital it's also more fun uh, kk last word from you so it's difficult because everybody has said all the things I wanted to say. So I say I, thank you yeah, all the time. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to say thank you, and I want to say that uh, the uh, the heart team is probably the the key to a successful program. I also want to maybe take the opportunity to have everyone share you know data so that we can generate uh, Asia specific uh, data for research, uh, and this would be crucial as as we uh, you know um, as we evolve uh, our understanding of this disease. So. Like Jack said, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for participating in this uh, webinar, for your support for the consensus statements and for our continued uh, relationships and friendships. Thank you very much. So, um, again, thanks to uh, JCS APSC. This concludes uh, most of our session uh, tomorrow. Remember the convocation. I'd like to just make one point. I think I heard a lot. And I, I love the teamwork spirit uh, in this conversation. So can I say that the implanters are really the hands? but we really depend on echocardiologists to be our eyes. And I would say the heart team is the brain behind the patient. So I think we function all together for MitroClip successful procedure. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone, the participants who stayed all the way, as well as the faculty uh, for giving up their Friday afternoon and uh, keep safe, everyone. I'll see you very soon in person. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Careful, careful.